Did you did you grow up in Chicago? Mm -hmm. Grew up until I was four, uh, fourth grade at uh, Winona and Broadway. Uh, prior to that, I'm Buena. Okay. Yeah, I went to uh, Anchi Emmett Jewish Day School. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Also the same school. Then when we moved back from the Clinton years, Amy and I sent our kids, Zachariah, Lana, and Leah, they all went to Anchema too. Um, same Jewish day school we went. Okay. So so they say you started out doing, uh, you, got, you started out getting into politics and government. How? Uh, well, my first real kind of political on my own, not my mother. You know, my mother always would get us involved in campaign, actually. The first campaign, we went do uh, precincts and did door to door for Ab Mikvah. Okay, I remember. Uh, yeah, and then he, w when the race went back and forth each year against uh, Congressman Young or Congressman Mikvah, we were in Mikvah home. Uh, but my first kind of awareness of making a political decision and political action on my own was confronting the uh, neo Nazis uh, who said they weren't going to march and. Uh, got ruled by the court that they weren't going to go in Skokie, but they went to Marquette Park. And a lot of people said, well, they're not here now. So, And I said that, you know, wherever this hate speech is, you got to confront it, even if it ain't your so back. So that's when they had that video of you with no shirt on, all bony, no, no muscles mm -hmm. in your chest. <laughs> <laughs> but a full head had, of hair. And you had an afro, man. I had you had an afro, You know man. what we call it? What's that? Jufro. A Jufro. <laughs> 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 and, but you know uh, um, also because you're poking around, you know my background also from uh, North Lawndale with, uh, you know Alderman Scott's grandmother, mm -hmm. uh, Aunt Vern, which is how we called her. She used to, she basically took care of us when my mother was involved in CORE, Congress on Racial Equality. She'd be arrested a lot of times and Aunt Vern, we would go over to her home and sleep over there and that's where we were basically, you could argue a good portion of our childhood was spent in Aunt Vern's house. Yeah, you know, uh, so I knew about that. I know. Before you first ran, because my wife used to work with Sue Weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, Sue Weeks, who used to be Eugene mm -hmm. Moore's administrative assistant mm -hmm. and when he was a state rep and working for the Recorder D. So she said, yeah, Ron, he was so bad. You know, mm -hmm. we used to babysit them mm -hmm. and all them boys and they used mm -hmm. to fight and all yeah, that, that stuff. Boy, well, let's, wait a second. Ari did the fighting. I, I, I was a peacemaker. <laughs> let, let us be really clear. No, not the boys. A boy. A boy. A, Ari, Ari, Ari did the fighting. Well, Ari actually, Ari uh, was uh, hyperactive mm -hmm. before they knew what hyperactive was. And Ari was severely dyslexic before they actually knew how to uh, diagnose those. And so dealing with his dyslexia and dealing with uh, his hyperactivity, uh, let's just call, he gave, he was a capital R rambunctious. Is that right? Yeah. Now I was known as the peacemaker in the house for the record, okay? Uh, Being the middle child? I never known a middle child to be a peacemaker, man. Walter. I got a little sister, she's no, a no. middle child, she want all the attention. No, no, middle children, I always joke, wrote a book, war or peace, we could do either one. Okay. Not war and peace. So you was a peacemaker. There was a peacemaker, and then there was, you know, if it, it wasn't going my way, we weren't playing. Mm -hmm. There was a famous story. We were, uh, the three boys were playing cards, and we were, it was the summer when we were in Israel. And I, basically, we were playing, and about an hour in, and I looked at my hand, and I realized, hey, I ain't, I ain't going to win this game. Took all the cards, threw them over the banister. So, so, so do you think that experience growing up with your mom being associated in the, on the west side and mm -hmm. fighting for... She did, uh, she did open housing and integration of the beaches in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Those were the big things she did here in the city. So, so do you think that that's why you're so comfortable with African-American people? Yeah, you know, I think that uh, uh, there's no doubt growing up um, my, uh, with my mom and my dad made me comfortable with people of all walks of life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and uh, because even though we were obviously, I'm Jewish, but you know, we used, Jewish? I know you find it shocking. Uh, Ram Israel Emanuel, but I'm a, I'm a, I know it was confusing, but I'm gonna help you. Uh, but we used to go to uh, Aunt Vern's church. And so different faiths, different race, uh, very comfortable. And I don't think it's, you know, when you look at both President Clinton and President Obama, different people I've worked with, um, and my, my own administration as mayor, and I am very comfortable. And people have noted that, and I think, I'm hoping, 
uh, Amy and I have succeeded in that same endeavor with our children. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, the way my parents, when I look back at things that I hated that they did with us, but then I look back at it and realize how much exposure they gave us to the world, helped us identify ourselves, but also making us very comfortable with people of different walks of life, backgrounds, sexual orientation. Your parents expose you to being dissatisfied with injustice early on. Huh? Oh, yeah, I mean, if you go, there is both from my parents' background, from our religion and the way my parents saw Judaism, there is no doubt that if you saw an injustice, you had a responsibility to address it, whether it affected you personally or affected somebody you cared about or didn't know. You had a responsibility. And, um, you know, my mother did it active in the civil rights. You know, we didn't mention my dad, but, you know, he comes to Chicago, barely a word of English, practicing medicine, trying to start a practice, you know, in 1962. And I mean barely had a word of English under his belt. Three boys, he's trying to start a practice. The nut quits the AMA over national health care because he was in favor of universal national health care in 1962. Wow. And he's trying to practice medicine without being a member of the American Medical Association. And he doesn't even speak English. And he's got three boys that he has to feed. Um, so, uh, and then he led the campaign. You know, we all talk about removing lead from paint. Mm -hmm. It was my dad who led the effort in Chicago to remove uh, lead from uh, household paint. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So the whole house was steeped in um, uh, activism, civic engagement, and dinner conversations. Now, remember, we're also not a nuclear family. Growing up, the first six years of my life, my grandmother on my father's side lived with us. Uh, my grandparents on my mother's side lived with us for about two years in the basement. We had different uh, cousins and uncles all along the way live with us. And then we had a foster child. And then we also ado adopted a girl. And so it's not your nuclear family by any stretch of the imagination. If anything, it had a, a lot more of an image of a kibbutz than it did, uh, you know, here was a family of five. And in fact, when we brought, a, when we had a foster child, <clears throat> Ari and I shared a room because the state required that he had his own room. And so, uh, and when my grandparents on my mother's side, Herman and Sophie moved in with us for two years, uh, we had, a, Ari and I had a, a stay in the room. So that's how we were and then my mother was basically Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. She was either out of town on the civil rights movement or she was in jail. And my dad was trying to figure out how to start a practice and he quit the AMA over health care. Um, uh, and I don't mean it that way, but he, he, if you were thinking about your family, you probably could have had to express your views about na universal national health care without uh, doing it the way he did. And then right after that, he took on the city of Chicago Public Health Department as it related to getting lead out of uh, household paint because he was seeing the damage it was doing to kids' brains. So how are you and your family related to Mount Sinai House Hospital? What do you mean how are we related to it? Did your family have to do something well, with, with well the my, hospital? Well, first of all, um, you know, that's where my uh, dad practiced. Mount Sinai, my grandfather, my mother's side, my, so my dad practiced there. It is where my mom and dad met. They met at Mount Sinai. Yeah, yeah. This is a family-friendly uh, TV show. We'll just keep how they met uh, <laughs> private, but okay. they met at Mount Sinai. I think within about two weeks of knowing each other, they, my dad proposed to my mother. She was a nurse there. Oh, she was a nurse. My grandfather, I'm a Herman, who I always talk about, and my grandmother, they both lived in Lawndale, met at a dance for Eastern European Jews in Douglas Park, mm -hmm. in near uh, Mount Sinai. And my mother, before they moved to Albany Park, grew up in Lawndale. She went to, her elementary years were in, La in uh, Lawndale. 
So you're a West Side. <laughs> so you should, right. be, you should be saying West Side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when I was when I grew up around Aunt Giddy and Grandpa Herman, it was West Side. <laughs> <laughs> if you're, if, <laughs> yeah, I, it's tra it, the West Side has changed the way you pronounce it. Because when I grew up, it was the West Side. West Side. Uh, West. <laughs> the West became West Side. That's how Aunt Giddy used to say. It. Check that out. Mm -hmm. So then, so. You had that activism in your life. You mm -hmm. come from the West Side, mm -hmm. was ingrained in the West Side. You sure. Grew up around some some African American influence. I'm mm -hmm. sure you probably ate some soul food and stuff uh, back in the day. It's where I learned how. Uh, why you don't eat an apple? You cut an apple and eat it with salt. That's how Aunt Vern used. That's to why we have high blood pressure, right? Okay, but, yeah. and you skin <laughs> it, right. and then no, it's okay, man. I'm that's uh, good. I. I know everything Aunt Vern used to make for us. Check it out. So, so you said MICFA right. e election was the first time you got got involved. Mm -hmm. How did you? So everybody say you started out as a fundraiser uh, for Daily. That's not true. Okay. So what? How did you get to that point? I work. Uh, it, it is and isn't true. Okay. I graduate college. I'm in college. I'm working on a campaign. I did. So I come to be the candidate's driver. David Robinson running against Paul Finley in 80. I was his driver. One day in the campaign, we were getting some support and I thought the, the people could have given more. So I called him up, I said, you know, this check just ain't big enough. So let me send it back to you, you clearly made a mistake. I don't even know where I found the gumption to do that. <clears throat> and then people said, oh, well, you got a talent for that. Go back to finish school, come back to Chicago and I start working for Illinois Public Action Council. The community organizer. Really? Group. Yeah. I never knew that. That was my first work job was out of college, was working for Citizen Action. Wow. Working on utility issues and environmental policy. Are you kidding me? Where have that been? Why well, I never heard that? Before. It's been in my record. Been uh, what I talked about before. It's been in my actually when I first ran for Congress. Well, I, I guess about it. you know media only say what they want to no, say. Oh well, you got to think. Um, I become really known media-wise. Uh, Ob Obama, Clinton, or Cl that's kind of. But no, that's my first job. Okay. And then uh, uh, in um, 82, Citizen Action decides to help Lane Evans, and I go and help the Lane Evans campaign. And that's where I kind of get the bug about doing politics. Met Quello there. I happen to go back to school, get my master's pretty quickly, but then I become the Midwest political director for the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. And it's the first time that the, the political arm nationally sets up field operations in the country. We did really well, became political director nationally in the 88 cycle, then come back home and work for uh, then Mayor Daley's 89 campaign, helping on fundraising. And that's where I direct. That you could argue, but there's a 89, I get out of school, 82, there's six years, uh, seven years, eight years before that, uh, which I did in Northwestern. But, and that's where I emerged. And then after 89, uh, within about a year later, I moved down to Little Rock to head up Bill Clinton's fundraising. And that's why people talk about it from daily to, that it's fundraising. Yeah, they say daily to Clinton. They never go b before that. No, I was, my first politics was in issue politics in citizen action around uh, utility issues, environmental issues. So you were like fighting, fighting for people. Fighting combat and fighting uh, environmental you, dumpers. You, you was like some of those people who be coming down here. <laughs> <laughs> people that stand outside my That's office. Right. No, I've been there. I've been there. You've been yeah. on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. crazy. Yeah, that that was my first real. That was what I did when I got out of college, and then I uh, pretty quickly go work on a campaign or as independently, but I help. Lane Evans get elected to Congress, and that's where I realized I wanted to be involved in campaigns. That's how it got started. But I didn't, you know, and it all goes back to this summer intern where I was a driver for what was going to be a summer job, a driver for a guy running for Congress, and I realized I had the bug for politics. Check but now, out. what's weird is I've met friends of mine from high school. They said, oh, we always knew you were going to be involved in politics. Is that right? I didn't know that. They said they knew it, and even their mothers our parents said they knew it because of my what I talked about in high school. I mean, you know this. It's been that part's been talked about, which is I had a background in dance, 
I had a scholarship to the Joffrey Ballet, which I didn't take. But then when I didn't do that at school, I studied early childhood education. That's really what I wanted to do. So you did a lot of things with early childhood education mm -hmm. and you, before you became mayor. Yeah. W were you doing it? Were you do so, you know, it was a funny thing. Uh, one of the ladies who work at, used to work at Family Supportive Services, we were talking about you running and you and all this stuff. And, 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 and she was like, oh, no, he's good. I, I worked with him, uh, the African-American lady who used to work for, she retired, she used to work for uh, uh, Family Support Service. She said, no, no, me and him been on boys and we was fighting for early childhood education and mm -hmm. he's serious and all these things, you know, because I was, you know, you know, initially I didn't support you, right? I don't know if you know that. Hopefully, I do, Walter, don't worry, I've gotten I, over it. <laughs> I keep I keep one eye on uh, 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 <laughs> Walter's a hundred percent. Yeah. So initially I was neutral in your first campaign. Well, you were like Amy, neutral. <laughs> Amy was. I'll tell you a funny story. So, so when we when I was running for Congress, somebody one of my uh, Amy, we come out of voting. You know, your husband and wife, you go up and vote, blah blah. And somebody said, "What's it feel like to vote?" first time to ever have to vote for your husband. She goes, what makes you so sure I voted for him? <laughs> <laughs> so you were neutral on me running for mayor, kind of consistent with Amy being neutral on me running for mayor. So yeah, she was, she, her, she wanted me to our Congress, but she, her first thing was how does it impact the kids? So what were you doing with early childhood education? Well, you know, for, I don't mean to go back, but I think this is true. You would agree with this, Walter. So you know my dad's a pediatrician. Right. And uh, my interest in uh, early childhood education, my interest in early years of children, all come back from, used to go on rounds with my dad and his view. My dad was not your typical pediatrician. He was more of a family doctor. But he was so much about early years and kids' years. You know, our whole emphasis on helping parents become ready to be parents comes, I remember when he himself made his own pamphlet for newborn, new parents who weren't sure what it was because they didn't grow up in a home about with good parenting skills, how to train people how to be parents. That there was like about reading to kids. This is back in the 60s and 70s. My dad had a pamphlet. He's way ahead of time. Huh? That he made himself. And uh, so my, I, I knew from my days and then teaching, and I uh, was also involved in this, but not just in, in college, I was a, a, a teacher at early childhood, Montessori school at Sarah Lawrence. You were a teacher? Yeah, I was a teacher assistant. That's you were what, a teacher assistant? Yes. Man, how many jobs have you had, man? Well, that's what, it was a part of Sarah Lawrence's education, and I'm fascinated by it, and I think you would agree that we have done a lot as a city now, getting to universal full day kindergarten and working towards that, and it comes out of what, doing things with my dad, but also my own value as a father. I think about things that we've done, Amy and I, about our kids' early years and our ex uh, exposure and making sure that they're getting that experiences and my interest in that, that then carry forward and working on efforts for it early with the Children's Defense Fund. So I don't know if you want to talk about uh, Amy and, and sure. how you guys met. Uh, I've heard that story. Um, what, you mean the blind date? Yeah. Yeah. So t tell us how you met Well, the w first of all, let me, the w person that gets credit uh, is Antonio Contro, who's the head of Marwin, the after school. Oh, Marwin, yeah. a great organization. Okay. So. Oh, that's so, okay. Okay, so I, Tony I, and I, she and I know each other. Right. From my citizen action days. Is that right? She had a best friend that worked with me, Susan Matucci. Check that so out. So we were all friends, da da da, da. I knew Tony uh, well. Tony and Amy work together at the Art Institute. Amy comes to Chicago from Cleveland, gets a master's in art, medieval art history from U of C. They're working together at the uh, Art Institute. Somewhere in the point, uh, Tony says, I don't know, they were in a meeting, I wasn't there, but the way I, is Tony says, are you seeing Amy to Amy, Amy, to Amy? Amy says, you know, on and off, but nothing serious there. You, and Tony asks her, are you serious, wanna meet people? She goes, yeah, she goes, I think I got somebody for you. And uh, <clears throat> so we agree to uh, go out on a date. This will tell you everything you need to know. From her. So she lives in an apartment building at that point. I arrived 10 minutes early. 
big mistake, man. Now, I am punctual to a fault. Let's just say Amy's view of time is a more elastic view. And that should have given you the first indication. Now, uh, we went to dinner and then we went to listen to music, an Italian restaurant on uh, Lincoln and Clark area, Fullerton and Clark. And I know you find it hard to believe, but she thought I was arrogant. And I thought she, she was cold. She yeah, was no, is that shocking? What's, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, and she said, I said, well, if you, you know, at the end of the night, I said, well, if you want to call me, you know, if you want to get together, go ahead and call me. She goes, if, if you want to get together, you go ahead and call me, but I'm not going to call you. I said, okay, that's, she's got, okay. All right. So about two weeks later, I had tickets to a play uh, down in Pilsen. I gave her, it, I gave her a call, and. We didn't think, I don't think we were, thought we were going to see each other, but we decided to go to play, and then the second day we kind of hit it off. And that was the beginning of our uh, romance. So where was Amy working? Art Institute. She was at the Art Institute. Yeah. Okay. She was working at the Art Institute, and uh, um, then about, I don't know what the time frame is, about six, nine months later, I moved to Little Rock, and we kept dating. Back well, long yeah. distance relationship. You had to go, and those there's no direct flight, so you had to go through. You had to really want to see each other because she either had to go through Memphis to come down to Little Rock or Nashville, and I had to obviously go through those two cities to come back up. And uh, we kept dating through the campaign, all the way to the White House, uh, where I'm the White House. Okay. And uh, I run the we run the campaign. We get elected. I run the inaugural. I'm in Washington, etc. I'm living out of a hotel. I'm in the White House, political director. We're dating through the whole campaign and everything like that. And I said, why don't we go on? A, I said, you, can you, you can find, and she's in Chicago. I'm in DC. And uh, I said, I would really like to take a break. I didn't want to take a break because we were starting the White House, but I wanted to take a break. I didn't have gotten a break because from the campaign, I went to the inaugural, to the inaugural right in the White House. So about two months in, uh, I said, let's go to uh, St. Lucia. And um, I never, I don't think I've ever told this story, so I really hope she's not watching. Uh, she's going <laughs> to yell at me. So I go to, uh, she goes, great. So we, I was going to go to the, and I made a decision I was going to propose to her in St. Lucia. And I didn't have time to get a ring because I was working at the White House. So I called uh, a jeweler. They had by Brinks, those were the days that you could drive up to the White House. By Brinks truck, they delivered, I ordered it, but we Xeroxed what kind of ring shape I wanted. They delivered the uh, ring by Brinks shop, uh, Brinks truck. I got the ring and we went to, uh, and I hit it. And uh, we were in St. Lucia and uh, it was a sunset. And we were having a drink uh, after a whole day just being on the beach and stuff. I ran upstairs, got the ring, and I proposed to her on the beach of St. Lucia. But I, I, I thought it was funny that I never even went and looked at the ring. I just did it by faxing. Those were the days you still faxed. I faxed back and forth this picture, and they found the ring, and that was the ring. And I said, we'll get it reshaped around your size. They asked me, well, what was the ring size? I said, I don't know. Skinny fingers. I don't know. I have no idea. But that's how, and I proposed to her. Did she accept? Thanks, Walter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, three keys. Three kids later, she's thinking about it. So. <laughs> sure, her, her vote is an end. But here, uh, and I'll give you the worst. So she said yes. She still lives in Chicago. She moves to Washington for me. Loved her job, loved living here in Chicago. Moved to be with me. And the day she arrived, and we bought a uh, condo together. And the day she arrived is the day that Mrs. Clinton, through Mac McClarty, informed me that they were going to let me go from the White House. Really? The day she arrived. So she has no job. I'm let off from my job. We own a condo, and I don't, I don't have a bucket to spit so in. So you say Mrs. Clinton? Hillary. There's a famous story. We, okay. Uh, I, it had to do with the travel office and me. I know you find it shocking expressing my view of the right or wrong or whether you should do that. And it got me in trouble. 
And then I told uh, Mac McClarty, the chief of staff, I said, I'm not leaving. I don't even know where I found the idea. I said, I'm not leaving till the President of the United States tells me I'm asked to leave. He goes, what do you mean? I said, you can't fire me. I've been through Little Rock. I've been through New Hampshire. I've been through everything with him. He wants me gone. He has to tell me I'm fired. I don't even know why I found, where I found the courage to say that. And Clinton said, keep him. And then the, I stayed on and I worked my way back into becoming senior advisor. But the day she arrived, I was told I was fired. And she had no job and she moved to D.C. to be with me. Wow. So how long ago was that? Bill Clinton gets sworn in in, November, in January 93. It's summer of 93. So you all been married? But we got married in um, June of 94. The, uh, this is also, I got, we got married in the South Shore Cultural uh, Center. It was the same weekend uh, that Bob Woodward's book came out about the Clinton White House and the economic, the agenda, I forgot the title of it. But we were all reading the book because it had such an impact on the interpretation of Bob's, uh, the President Clinton's economic team. My wedding turned out to be kind of like a rapid response <laughs> operation. It, 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 this, our, my political activities permeated everything of our, we can, we somewhat measure where we are in our lives with our children and our family based on different moments of well, probably working for President Obama. So was Obama. that 23 years? 1994, June 1994. Is that 20, did I add that right? 94 is 23 years. We've been married 23 years. Fantastic. Yeah. That's good. So tell me this. So, so you say you're Jewish, right? So you you religious. I, I don't say it, but yes, you I am are. Yeah. Okay. So so is Amy is Amy Jewish? She, convert, yeah. she converted to Judaism. Yeah, my I have a joke. So Amy's family, she's Episcopalian. Okay. She's gonna convert so we can raise the kids Jewish. Her parents, who are Midwestern, small manufacturer Republicans. Are you kidding me? I'm not joking. <laughs> One iota. Navy, three generations. Wow. Pensacola. Uh, her family meets Rabbi Frankel, who is the rabbi that bar mitzvah me, who's going to marry Amy and I. Uh, that night after meeting the rabbi, uh, my father-in-law, Ao, has a small heart attack. Wow. This is like call it four or five days before the wedding. So he's in the hospital. Everything he's obviously recoups comes to the wedding. And my joke at the toast of my wedding was Ao, we're all glad that Ao's here. When he met the rabbi, a lot of you assumed that because of the shock of Amy becoming Jewish, just was too much for him to absorb. It had nothing to do with Amy becoming Jewish. It was when he discovered that Amy was gonna become a Democrat. <laughs> 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 he was okay with the Jewish okay part. The, Jewish the Democrat part. part was just the bridge too far. Uh, yeah, so she can, uh, uh, and when we went through our class, this was with our rabbi in Washington, um, which is a hard thing to ask somebody when you think yeah. about it. You know, Walter, you're asking somebody to change. Now, I grew up observant Jew, and obviously Judaism is not just a religion, but it's steeped in my identity. Amy acknowledged that her religion wasn't a major part of her life. But you are asking somebody to adopt something on behalf of you. And so on the car ride out there, Amy said, I, you know, I don't know if I can do this. This is a car ride from when we left the White House. We would go to the synagogue and participate in a class. And then by the time that each class was over on the car ride back, she would say, well, this isn't that bad. And I would say, I just can't ask you to do this. So we would reverse our positions each way. But in the end of the day, and then we came back here and she had the mikvah, which is a process to become a Jew. And she adopted the faith and we have uh, scrupulously raised our children to be Jews and be proud of who they are. And I give her a lot of credit because um, I, I couldn't do it. That sounds like love to me, man. It is. It is. Uh, and I, don't, I could not do it. It's a hard and you got to uh, appreciate that somebody was cared enough about somebody else to make that journey, uh, to express that. And it's a big thing. But, you know, I think we both also appreciate that faith is an important part of uh, grounding kids. I don't know how you do it with Walter Jr. and everything, but I think, um, you know, I, it's interesting. I just will say this now that, you know, 
we got two in school. Today was our last high school parent-teacher conference. Lay Leah's a senior. But I have thought more and more, and I will tell you, I've become much more of a traditionalist as both a parent and then in this job, more as a parent, about the importance of family, structure, faith, in the nurturing of a human being. And I have each day, I will tell you, I become much, much more of a traditionalist. Some people say, oh, you're, but I, I don't really care what family, everybody has a different family, everybody has different things, but I have become much more of a traditionalist and believe of how important that is for a child. Well, do you think that? I, mean, oh, you're yeah, I, I do, I do. You know, I'm a deacon in my church, and my son grew up in the church. But don't you but think? But you see the results. Yes. As your kids grow up and how they are, mm -hmm. and you know it's because of how you brought them up. Without a doubt, and I have, uh, I've seen my kids as I get as they're entering the next chapter of their lives, and I think about the things that we did, and the foundation we gave them to be able to make judgments, um, uh, and I think their faith, their sense of their uh, own humanity, and their and their position in life. Or their role in life and what they should do. I think that I've just, I'm just telling you, I've, I've actually started to reflect more on it and I will say that I have become much more of a traditionalist in the importance of family. Well, and then you think about what all happened with you and your family, your parents. Oh, without a doubt. How they brought you and your brothers up. I mean, each of you all are living it today. Wouldn't you say, though, you also agree that you swore when you were growing up you would never do these things and then oh, you find without yourself? Oh, doubt. Yeah. Yeah, I, you sometimes you become more stricter than they are, sure. you know. Yeah, you know, deeper than they mm -hmm. they were. I yeah. so you and I have our kids are somewhat. Uh, you have one left in school or done? No, no, it's done. It. One left? Yeah, Walter. Right. Right. He's yeah, Walter. Just about done. done. Right. I will say that I am much more. I'm also immensely proud of how they've grown, uh, who they are now. And like I had a great summer with my son Zach, and the weird thing is, now you can be friends, and they're like on. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, and it's really, because I will tell you, you know this because we talked about three years ago. The judge would have let me off on manslaughter, <laughs> man. He just said, you know what, you did, you, you did, because I'm telling you, three years ago, teenagers, mm. right? When he was a teenager. Uh huh. But yeah. now he's like one of my best friends. Yeah. Same and here. Alana too. I talked to her. She's a brown. I talked to her every day. She calls me every day. It's a wonderful thing. Uh-huh. So we appreciate um, all that. You seem like you lived a uh, unique life. I'm learning a lot just talking to you right here. I probably know more than most of the aldermen now, so I'm not, maybe I may not put this on TV or nothing, just keep it to myself. <laughs> but anyway, um, so, so you got into politics. What made you want to run for office after working for all these guys? You know, uh, well, wasn't I didn't want to. I, I wanted to stay involved in politics and public. Uh, so, so here's the thing. I tell Clinton at the end of his first term, I'll say I'll stay through the balanced budget and NATO expansion, get your second term agenda in place, and I'm gonna leave. Because Zach had been born, Amy and I wanted to start a family, and I didn't have any resources, and I'm starting a family. Uh, all that stuff that you say that people observe, click in. You know, you're now a father. You have a, you know, balanced budget happens, kid health care happens, we do the NATO expansion, and then the uh, scandal breaks in the second term. And I already had a job lined up back in Chicago and everything. And I turned out, I told the job, I said I wasn't going to take it. And I told, and Amy says, well, you know, we have a son. And I said, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be nothing if it wasn't for Bill Clinton, uh, per politically, professionally. And I believed that uh, I owed him a, a loyalty. And I also thought what the government uh, was doing was wrong. And so I stayed through that, et cetera. Come out, we, when he settled and everything is secure, uh, I leave around October 98. I have a funny story about that too. But anyway, I, we go out and make, uh, and I'm involved in the private sector making money so I could have a family. Right. And I was going to go back to public life when I, everything was secure financially. 
and uh, I'm watching the kids wash and I'm washing the car on our driveway and uh, the congressman Rob Lagojevich is running going on one of his runs sees me running by the house so we talking he's telling me he's gonna run for governor would like some help and so on and so forth and as he's running away going north on our block he looks over his left shoulder says you should run for Congress <laughs> I had never thought about it I was actually doing everything I was gonna go back one day in the Gore administration five minutes later I walk in the house talking to Amy and through thick and thin a couple months I decided you know what I don't want to ever look back and say I would have could have should have but I had not thought about running for office until he basically said I'm, he's running and he, he put the kind of set it freelance and I started talking about Amy I said you know what I probably don't want to just go work in another administration I'd like to be on my my own person and so I decided I wanted to and I was and I had already achieved the financial security so I'd be just waiting time for another Democratic administration and I know you know this by now patience is not one of my strong suits so I decided I'm just gonna run and I ran for Congress and at that time as you remember Dan Rosinkowski, Rob Bogoyevich, Flanagan, Roman Buczynski, and Anunzio had all held that seat. It was not a seat known for a, Jew, for a Jewish person. It was a seat for a Catholic, based on you know, how Chicago politics is. And that time, uh, I, was running, I ran against Nancy Kazak, and everybody said, well, she's Polish, state rep. That's her deal. And I decided to run, and it was not a seat that would have a Jew and the history. Let me. Do, I had a show. They did. They. I had to prove that I was a citizen of Chicago. I was born in Chicago, and I was not a citizen of Israel. I had to show my papers. Mm. It was. A, you know. So when Obama was going they through that, they challenged you on that. I had to show my birth certificate that I was born here. Wow. And the Tribune made me do it. <coughs> wow. And uh, so when deep. when Obama was going through all that stuff about. Kenya, I knew exactly what that was all about. Because when I was running for Congress on the North Side, nobody asked Nancy to show her papers. Check that out. I knew exactly what that score was. From, you know, when I ran for Congress, there was a whole big debate. Is he really a citizen of America? Yeah, that was, was he all, really born here? That was also to expose the fact that you were Jewish, too. Oh, you think? Yeah. yeah. Hey, Walter. <coughs> Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That I know what that campaign was about. Thank God, people are bigger than that. I said then when uh, so Moscow from the uh, PNL said we don't need the I think it was a charge we don't need the money changers or something like that. And I said, look, I met people on money the money changers. I knew, I met people on the front stoops. I met them at the L's. I met them at the grocery store. I have absolute faith in the people of this district that gonna make a decision based on character. But I know that score. Check that out. So, so you ran. You right. became congressman. You won. I won. Two years later, I'm putting leadership to win back the house. Win back the house, and Nancy Pelosi becomes the first female speaker of the house in the history. And then, keep repeating that as caucus chair, as well as head of the campaign. And then Obama asked me to be his chief of staff, which so, I also have a theory about. Uh, so, so did you stop being congressman? Yeah, you got to give it up. So you stopped being congressman to become Obama's chief of staff. It's a full, it ain't a part-time job. So you gave up a, and you were. Congressional seat. And we gave so up. So you were a leader. You were like raising money for all the congressmen. I, right? was, a, I, was, I was a caucus chair. I was, fourth was caucus in, I was fourth in leadership in my second term. Third so you, term. So you gave up a lot to go with Obama. Gave up that, but also Amy and I had gotten a balance between my work and our family. And she was really enthusiastic about, once again, pulling up stakes and going out to Washington. <laughs> she was enthusiastic. I've, I've, yeah, I, I, yeah. I've made her do that. So she's been very supportive of, yeah, uh, and it's been, but it's also been good for the kids, the exposure. Yeah. And then, uh, it's a lot of sacrifice. To it's a lot, stuff. you, you yeah. know, this, your, your, your family, yeah. our spouses sacrifice and our family sacrifice a lot. But the one thing we, and I do this, I always tell people this, when I first ran for Congress, got elected, we made a rule about our Sabbath dinners, our Sunday dinners, and then obviously the other Sabbath is on Friday. Shabbat dinner, yeah. Amy makes a mean challah bread, man. Do she? Yeah. It's, uh, so Obama and I once had a kick. Uh, he claimed he made good pancakes. I said, I make good French toast. On Saturday mornings after the Shabbat, 
with a challah bread. Because all challah bread is eggs with more eggs. <laughs> okay? And if you don't think you have enough eggs, put another one in it. And she makes a challah bread with cinnamon. It's a homemade bread. So I made a French toast and I kicked his butt. His pancakes were nowhere close to my French toast. <laughs> so, but you got to raise your kids and make sure. So I set up a rule. These are my family times. You can organize a schedule around that, not fit my family around my politics. So you all made that decision, mm -hmm. um, and Amy made the decision to go with you to Washington. Here's I go for the first six months by myself. We agree that she and the kids would stay here so the kids could finish their school here. Then they came, and we were there. They grew up and through that process, and then we came back when I ran for mayor. So, so. How did this mayor stuff come up? How did mayor come up? How did, how, did, how did you, well, what made you decide from being with Obama after being congressman, after making money, I think, right? I think you could have just gone off into the sunset, right? Yeah, well, what, do I look like somebody that likes to ride <laughs> off to the sunset? Uh, and, 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 and look, and, you and, know this and, well. And especially, especially in this economy, well, when things were challenging, Yes, a lot of people said, I don't want to, the economy, I think. It's you, like, are you a glutton for pain or punishment or what, what's the deal? Why, why, why would you choose this to This is be a great city, listen, this is a great city. A great city. And then With at that time, I was the chairman, I don't know if you know, I was the chairman of the Black Caucus at I that do. time. And, you Did know, you know that you weren't for me? Yeah, <laughs> anyway, so I was chairman of the Black Caucus at that time, and, and you know, of course, everybody was like, we need a black mayor, we need all this black stuff going on, you know, and uh, why would you get involved at that time? Um, look, uh, I think being mayor of Chicago is a big job where you can do really big things, and I think this is an incredibly great city. And I wasn't done in public service. And I had been chief of staff. The run of the chief of staff is about 16, 17 months. I had already done it in 19. And I couldn't go back to Congress. I didn't want to go back to Congress. I wanted to be my own chief executive. And I wanted to take, uh, a take on a big task of helping build a city. And then at the end of the day, the real truth is, the reason I ran is because I believe you could fix the public school system. I think you could make education uh, and a big city school said so a lot of people don't think you can do it. You, we can do it and we're doing it here in Chicago. And that's why I ran. I Look, I knew we had fiscal challenges. I knew we had economic stuff. I knew we had pension issues. I got to be honest, that's politics. Meaning, how much more are you going to put in? What pain can you... But the reason I ran is because I believe that you could do and get kids off to a good start by through... They don't get a second chance. You've got to get the education right, and that's why I ran. So to get where you are today, mm -hmm. in regards to being mayor of the city of Chicago, you had to make a lot of hard decisions, right? A lot of hard ones, and every day. Right, and even though the ends justify the means, politically nobody see it at that time, mm -hmm. but you never, you always just do it, not worried about the repercussions of getting it done. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Not on everything. Well, on on on, 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 the on, big stuff. on, a, on a lot of this big right. stuff that you do, because you know it's going to be. Okay. You see the back side of it. What makes you? What gives you that strength to stand up to do what you think is right? Yeah. And and know that know that there's that there's challenges going to come with it. Oh. But you do it anyway. Oh, what, 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 I mean, you're not afraid to do what you think is right and what's well, going to be Well, first of all, that's what city. my parents raised us to do. You didn't, I didn't get in here. I mean, I know what the reputation. I got in here to make a difference. Right. I got in here also, if you see an injustice, you're supposed to fix it and not comment about it. This is not about how, I mean, I don't look at my run, being mayor about what, how long I can be mayor. It's what I've done when I've been mayor. Mm -hmm. That's my measure. It's not about the length of how many years you're mayor, that's not the measure of your success. The measure of success is what was the state of the city you inherited across the things, and is it better off when you're done? Whether you did it in X years or Y years. If you see something that you're supposed to fix, you have a moral responsibility to go fix it. So I'll tell you one anecdote. It was like the second or third day of the strike, teacher strike. Mm -hmm. 
I'm getting ready to, you know, I've done my exercise, whatever, and I'm about ready to walk out of the house. So I have, we have a routine. I go swim, come back, have breakfast with the kids, go get ready. They're, they leave, I get ready, and then I leave. Amy looks at me, I get my, bat, my leather bag. She goes, you know what? I've never seen you calmer. She goes, I've seen you through an impeachment. I think you've seen you through welfare reform, NAFTA, the assault weapon man. I've seen you through health care. Looks right <laughs> like this. I've never seen you calmer. And this is, a, remember, about the full school day, the full school year. I said, I've never felt more right about what I was doing. And if you think about it, Walter, you've been by my side. We have pretty much, there's not a thing on education we haven't been willing to take on, even tough things that other people said, okay, that's too tough, forget it. Meaning the politics aren't pretty, but you got to do it. Whether that was school consolidation, full school day, full day kindergarten, full school year, tougher rigor around academic standards, changing the community colleges to a career-based education. There's nothing we have not done that we were supposed to do or taking schools and flipping them to AUSL. I have to say that because I'm going to the dinner tonight. We have taken those on. We have never pulled our punches. And I think whether that's true on pensions, education, finding resources to invest in neighborhoods, the one thing, whether some people in my staff think I've taken too many, nobody, I've never kicked the can down the road and never pulled my punches on something I thought we had to do that was important to the future. I may not have gotten it all done, may not have done it exactly on the, what that person said I had to do, but we have never, ever so what's the pushed it off. what's the results of all those things that you've done? The real question, look, I can give you other measures. I have one measure. You have a pretty diverse district. You have parents that go send their kids to Brown, and you have parents that send their kids to Skinner West. Pretty different world, right? And they're not far apart. Right. If kids coming out of Skinner look at the city, that's really right around them. They go, that's Chicago, I live there. And kids come out of Brown. They look at what's the same thing within about eight blocks, right? And they look at it and they go, that's downtown as if that's another world. That means it's more than a geographic gap. It's a psychological gap. The only way you and I are going to do what we got to do and our time is worthwhile is whether when the kids out of Skinner and Brown, Skinner West and Brown walk out and they look around and they call it home. The whole city. Yes. I kind of try to poetically try to say, my kids grew up in Ravenswood, other kids grew up in Roseland. They look at the same city, do they think it's their city? That's our measure. And I, in your ward, I'm just using Brown and Skinner West, they're not far apart by, they're less than a, uh, two miles, they're a mile and a half, they're not far. No. Do you think the kids have the same perspective? No. Our job is to make sure they have the same perspective because if they have the same perspective on what they call their home, Nothing's going to hold us back. It's so one city. You got it. That's our measure. Yeah. So, you know, um, I appreciate you coming on the show. It's my first time ever having a mayor on my show. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's the first time I've ever called, been called my Hebrew homie. So right. I, ha I owed you one. Well, you are my <laughs> homie, man. You know. Um, so I really appreciate it. And, w and there's a lot of other stuff that I can talk to you about. You know, but but it's good that you know we got to talk about the personal stuff. One of the things that I did want to point out uh, that maybe a lot of folks don't know, you know, it seemed like it seemed like uh, in your cabinet. I'm looking at your cabinet. Mm -hmm. Over fifty percent of your cabinet is women. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. What's up with you and these women, man? Is it because you know because of the ballet stuff and mm -hmm. you want to hire have, be so, around so, a lot so of women? Or, somebody or, said or, my the, ballet <laughs> stuff. You know, I went to a women's school. <laughs> you went to a women's school. That's okay. what it is, okay. man. You want to no, be around you, women? Well, for, here's the thing. Uh, I'm all about and they're all smart women. All smart women. They are. They are. Yeah, you know, I'll give you a, fu a funny story. So you know, I just introduced my budget. You know, when I do with my budget. Uh, I have to go to all the Sun Times editorial, Tribune editorial, Cranes editorial. So I walk in, and what comes with me is my economic team: Carol Brown, the CFO of Chicago; 
African American female. Sam Fields, Samantha Fields. She's a budget director. African American female. Erin. She walks in. White female. Yeah. And we sit down. I've been when in every one of those rooms. I've over a hundred percent increased the Af minority representation. I in and I'm only three, four of us, and I increased the female representation by about a hundred percent. So you saying in in those rooms they? Didn't I don't. Have, I'm, I'm just saying. They didn't well, have I had no diversity. I, I, I but just, you did. Okay. I got you. But here's my thing. My thing is Carol is unbelievable. Uh, Carol is an incredible CFO. Oh Sam is an incredible, but and they follow Lois Scott and Alex Hope. Right. Two women. Two other women. Yeah, and I here's the thing, and I also think in this you're asking me this, and there's we're in a political environment now. You can see what's going on. I actually think in women, and uh, it's not the reason I did it, but I actually think there's an additional benefit. You have women in position of power, crap ain't gonna go off underneath because nobody can use that power position to play with other people's lives. It's not why I did it, but it also sets a context. And uh, we do have a lot of, uh, I think it's like, it's like 58% of the cabinet and uh, commissioners are women. Yeah, I was looking at it. Asian women, black right. women, white women. Hispanic women. Hispanic women. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you, you're appointing a lot of them. You have a vi very diverse cabinet. I don't think anybody really looked at it. Uh, but it's very diverse. I commend you on that. Mm -hmm. But you have a lot of sharp people. You know, like I just did a thing with the, uh, and it'll be coming on my next show with the uh, City College Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, well, City College cha Chairman. Mm -hmm. A lot of passion, care about the community. He's the real deal. You probably was touched by his social activists because of your background. He cares about the people he will fight to make it better, mm -hmm. right? Um, so he's also got, a graduate of the community college, yes, so he, he knows yes, how yes, important he is. it is. So you have a, a lot of folks whose heart is into this. You know, one of the things that I, I know that a lot of people who work for the city in those positions, you know, some folks may say they're big positions, mm -hmm. but compared to what they would get paid in private industry, you know, how do you get all these good people well, to here's, work, to this work is here? Interesting. I want to say two other points, or make one point and then ask you a question. Um, that's what people also forget, is that people, uh, every one of these commissioners could go out in the private sector and make three times what they make here, four times. It is, that is financially rewarding, not psychologically or emotionally rewarding. And I, the head of planning, David Reifman, was a very successful private sector lawyer. Yeah, he, he's making money. And I said to him, I said, you can keep doing that or you can look back on your life and say, I will. Steve Koch. Right. All of them. You're your former um, corporation counsel. Uh -huh. Steve Patton. Uh, because there's nothing like public service. And what, here's the funny thing is when they go back, they're trying to figure out how to get back into public service because they know it's how m and rewarding it is. It's, it's not re remunerative financially, but there's nothing as rewarding as serving you others. You probably can leave and make a lot of money. I don't, you could strike the word probably. So I got five, five, I got minutes, one five minutes left. You man. said this is the only mayor that's been on the show. That's right. I think you would, you tell the truth. Don't you feel like if you ever had an issue, you could always call me? Man, I call you on the cell phone. I don't want everybody to know that because they may yeah, ask me I, to call you all the time. My point is that you can, <laughs> we, we, we talk you, all the time. We talk, but I'm a, if you have an issue, you always know always, I'm going to listen. Always. Doesn't mean you're always going to get a yes. Always. I, I remember you, uh, you called me up on the phone. And you say, hey, Walter. And I'm like, who is this? When you first, after you first get, get uh, sworn in, you, I guess you called all us up. And you say, hey, Walter. I'm like, who is this? He say, this is Rom. I'm like, Rom who? <laughs> 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 yeah. Rom the mayor, <laughs> and it's been like that ever since. Uh -huh. I appreciate the relationship, man. So I want to thank you for being on the show. I want to thank everyone for watching. Thank uh, you. I, I want to ask you, will you come on again? Because we got to finish up. Yeah, we got a lot. But I, I'll come on again, except for one thing. You got to promise me. I never told anybody about the St. Lucia, Lucia story. I don't know how that's going to go at home, man. <laughs> I may have to go. In, I may not only want to come on your show. I may have to come and move in. Do you have an Airbnb downstairs? Yeah, Can yeah. I rent a room? I may be. I may be looking for a room at the end of this. My mom stayed down there, but she got <laughs> she got some room for you to stay down there. But but 
So you may have to go get me and mom and me and mom Burnett are gonna room together. <laughs> That's right, perfect man. <laughs> I'm gonna be kicked out. I'm it'd gonna need be, some it'd space. It'd be like your old days, right? Okay. When you was a kid. But but you uh, you may have to go get another Brinks truck, man. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. Welcome, Thanks, you're a good man. man. I appreciate it. Toad Thanks, eye. Toad eye, brother. Okay. All right, man. Thank you very much. You know, you're making big progress on your Hebrew. No. Yeah. I'm really proud of you. I appreciate that. Toad eye and Zygazan. Yeah. Uh, thank you, everyone, for watching Network 27. I'm Alderman Walter Burnett here with uh, Mayor Rahm Emanuel. Um, see you next month. God bless.